Good day everyone, today we're going to discuss the first lesson under semi-final coverage and that is the Nolimetangere. Okay, so let's begin. As I pointed out in the previous chapter, the winter of 1886 in Berlin was a dreary one for Rizal. Penniless and with nothing to eat, he became very sickly. So ito yung episode ng buhay ni Rizal na wala siyang makain at nagkakasakit siya. Kasi nung time na to, wala nang maipadala yung kanyang pamilya na pera sa kanya kasi medyo hindi na ganun kalakasan yung business nila sa Kalamba, Laguna. Nonetheless, his publication of the Noli Metangere gave him great joy despite the hard life he had at Berlin. So napawi naman daw yung hirap at lungkot ni Rizal nung naidala niya na at nailabas na sa printing press yung kanyang first novel, The Noli Metangere. According to Rizal, during his stay in different European cities, he noted that Filipinos were practically an unknown nation. So, napansin ni Rizal nung nasa ibang bansa pala siya na hindi alam ng mga ibang lahi na meron palang mga Filipinos na nag-exist pala mga Pilipino at merong bansang Philippines. Napagkakamalan daw na Chinese ang mga Pilipino sa Spain. So, kung may mga Pilipino noon sa Spain, ang akala nila sila ay mga Chinese. And then, nung nasa Paris naman daw ang mga Filipinos, ang tingin sa kanila or ang akala nila sila ay mga Japanese. So, Rizal encouraged his fellow Filipinos to call themselves in just bravos for them to have a sense of national identity. Realizing the need for the Filipinos and the country to be known in Europe, Rizal presented a proposal on writing a novel about the Philippines to the Circulo Hispano-Filipino on January 2, 1884. Ito yung way ni Rizal para makilala ang mga Filipinos and the Philippines in Europe. Okay, gagawa daw siya at magsusulat siya ng isang libro na magtatalakay sa sociocultural and political aspects of the Philippines. The members of the organization anonymously approved this proposal. Pumayag naman daw sila na magsulat si Rizal ng isang libro. Unfortunately, the project did not materialize because those who were expected to collaborate with Rizal did not write anything on the subject. Wala naman naging contribution daw yung mga tao na gusto sana or in favor kay Rizal na sumulat ng isang libro. Okay? And in addition to this, Many of his fellow members were indifferent to the project since they were more interested to write about women. So, hindi rin natuloy. Okay? So, yung instead na may collaboration between Rizal and yung mga members ng Circulo Hispano-Filipino para makapagsulat ng isang libro, hindi rin naging effective. So, ang nangyari, si Rizal na lang din ang sumulat nung Noli Metangere. Rizal did not lose hope. Using his talent and writing skills, he started to write his masterpiece, The Noli Metangere. Now, let's try to look back yung journey ni Rizal habang sinusulat niya yung Noli Metangere. Rizal started writing the Noli Metangere in 1884. Okay, let me emphasize 1884 while he was studying in Europe. So, nag-aaral pa rin siya sa Europa nung sinulat niya ang Noli Metangere. He completed one half of the novel in Madrid, Spain. Take note, sa Madrid, Spain, natapos niya ang one half ng libro. One fourth of the novel was written when he was at Paris in France. One fourth sa Paris, France niya na natapos, while the remaining one fourth was completed in Berlin, Germany. Yung one fourth ulit ay natapos niya na sa Berlin, Germany. So natapos niya na isulat na kumpleto niya yung novel noong February 21, 1887. And then the novel came off the press on March 21, 1887 with the financial assistance of Maximo Viola. So, almost one month din bago na ilabas yung libro ni Rizal sa printing press. Kasi February 21, 1887, natapos niya. March 21, 1887, lumabas na sa printing press yung kanyang libro. Okay, I mentioned in the previous video lecture the inspiration of Rizal in writing the Noli Metangere. So, what was the inspiration of Rizal in writing this novel? It was The Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was a novel also na nabasa ni Rizal. Yung Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was a novel portrayed the brutalities committed by American slave owners to black American people. Okay, so somehow nakita ni Rizal na parang may pagkakawit pala yung story ng Uncle Tom's Cabin dun sa situation ng Philippines noon. Na yung mga black American daw dito sa Uncle Tom's Cabin ay ginagawang slaves. O ginagawa silang alipin ng mga white American people. And somehow sabi ni Rizal na Parang may similarities itong Uncle Tom's Cabin sa kwento ng Philippines. Kasi nung time na to, ang tingin rin sa mga Indio or sa mga Pilipino ay mga alipin. 
So this became the source of idea of Rizal in writing this novel about the Philippines. Okay, moving on, the Noli Metangere was printed in Berlin, Germany. Nagbayad si Rizal ng 300 pesos, that is good for 2,000 copies. His friend Maximo Viola offered to pay the amount. Kasi nung time na to, wala ng pera si Rizal. And pinautang siya ni Maximo Viola para mailabas niya at makapag-print siya ng Noli Metangere or ng kopya ng Noli Metangere. That is why Maximo Viola was considered as the savior of the Noli Metangere. Kasi kung wala si Maximo Viola, malamang hindi daw na iprint ni Rizal ang Noli Metangere. Kasi noon nagpaplano na siyang sunugin yung draft niya ng kwento or yung draft ng Noli Metangere. At the outset, the novel was untitled. Wala pa palang title etong novel ni Rizal nung una. Okay, hindi pa Noli Metangere ang title nito nung una. Wala pa, as in wala pa. Later on, he decided to call his first literary masterpiece Noli Metangere. That is why Rizal studied Hebrew to enable him to interpret the Bible in its original text. Okay, and of course, para ma-prepare yung kanyang sarili to defend any controversial religious issues that the Noli Metangere might arise. Yung Noli Metangere, it's a Latin phrase na galing sa Bible mismo. Okay, dun nakuha ni Rizal yung title na Noli Metangere. And kapag translate natin siya sa English, it means, touch me not. Sa Tagalog, huwag mo akong salingin, huwag mo akong hawakan. Okay? So, dahil galing nga sa Bible, it was from John chapter 20, verse 17. So, meron palang biblical basis etong novel ni Rizal. Kasi itong touch me not, ito yung nabanggit ni Jesus Christ to Mary Magdalene nung si Mary Magdalene ay bumisita dun sa tomb ni Jesus Christ before sunrise of Easter Sunday. Bakit naman kaya touch me not yung naisip ni Rizal na gawing title dun sa novel niya? Because according to him, it's appropriate to use the said title as his novel contained delicate things nobody wanted to talk about or touch during his time. Kaya pala Noli Metangere ang napili niyang title sa novel niya na to kasi ito daw ay naglalaman ng mga masaselan na pahayag, naglalaman ng mga masaselan na bagay na ayaw pag-usapan ng mga tao. Iniiwasan ng mga tao na pag-usapan itong nilalaman ng kanyang libro. Why? Kasi nga dito niya na binatikos, dito niya na-criticize yung mga maling uh, ginagawa ng mga Spanish friars ng Spanish government. At dito niya rin isiniwalat lahat ng mga masasamang uh, ginagawa ng mga Spaniards. So kung i-translate pala natin sa English ang Noli Metangere, it means the social cancer. And this idea of translation came from Charles Derbyshire. Alright, let's try to recall Rizal's arrival in the Philippines after his journey in Europe. So bumalik na si Rizal sa Philippines na pag na niya ng bumalik sa Philippines. Kasi unang-una, kailangan niya ng operahan yung kanyang nanay Teodora, okay? Para makure niya na yung sakit sa mata ni nanay Teodora. Pangalawa, para matulungan niya yung kanyang family and the Filipino people. Pangatlo, to find out for himself the Noli Metangere and his other writings that were affecting the Filipinos and Spaniards in the Philippines. And last but not the least, he wanted to find out why Leonor Rivera remained silent while he was in Rome. Ito yung mga rason kung bakit nag na si Rizal na umuwi ng Philippines after ng kanyang pagstay sa Europe. And on June 29, 1887, nagsulat na si Rizal sa kanyang ama na siya ay uuwi. And Rizal boarded the steamer Gemna, kung ano lang din yung sinakyan niya nung siya ay pupunta sa Europe. Nung kanyang first trip, yun lang din yung barkong sinakyan niya nung pauwi na siya. And according to Rizal, siya lang daw yung Pilipino na nakasakay doon sa barko. Okay? And since siya ay very well spoken, marami rin siyang alam na lengguahe, siya yung nagsilbing interpreter, siya yung nagsilbing translator ng kanyang mga kasama. And nabanggit niya din na ang kanilang hobby or pastime ay maglaro ng chess habang sila ay nasa biyahe. And then on August 6, nakarating na si Rizal sa Manila. He was welcomed heartily by his parents, relatives, and friends. And according to Rizal, wala naman daw pinagbago yung Manila. Simula nung umalis siya hanggang sa pagbalik niya, walang pagbabago. So nagstay siya doon for a very short time with his friends para mabisita sila. And then bumalik na siya sa Kalamba noong August 8. Amidst the happy and peaceful aura of his arrival, yung family ni Rizal ay nangangamba pa rin para sa kanyang kaligtasan. So yung kuya niya na si Pasyano, hindi siya iniiwan para at least may protection si Rizal or may magpoprotekta sa kanya kahit saan siya pumunta. And then yung father niya naman, hindi siya pinapayagan na umalis mag-isa. 
there is a possibility na may mangyaring masama sa kanya. Take note na mention ko sa previous lecture natin na naging sensational yung pag-uwi ni Rizal sa Philippines. Okay, parang yung time na to, bad shot na siya sa mga Spaniards. Kasi imagine, merong isang Pilipino na nakapag-aral sa ibang bansa, then uh, nakapagsulat ng mga iba't ibang literary works, especially yung novel niya na Noli and El Fili. Kaya nung time na to, malaking threat si Rizal sa mga Spaniards, okay? Kaya binabantayan na rin siya ng mga Spaniards nung time na to. Kaya, ganun na lang yung takot ng family ni Rizal na baka may mangyari masama sa kanya. Kaya, pinoprotektahan siya nung time na to. And then, after a few weeks ng kanyang pag-stay sa Kalamba, nakatanggap si Rizal ng letter from Governor General Emilio Terrero. Anong nilalaman ng letter? Nire-request na kailangan niya daw pumunta sa Malacanang Palace para mag-explain. Explain yung mga ideas na nilalaman ng Noli Metangere. So, anong ginawa ni Rizal? Yes, pumunta siya kay Governor General. Nakipagkita siya but he denied the charges and inexplain niya na inexpose niya lang naman daw yung katotohanan but he did not advocate subversion. Um, wala naman daw plano si Rizal na kontrahin yung pamumuno at pamamahala ng Spanish government at ng mga Spanish friars. Let me emphasize kasi na nung sinulat ni Rizal ang Noli, napaka-indirect, napaka-metaphoric yung pagkakagawa niya nung novel or nung kwento ng Noli Metangere. Okay? So, hindi niya directly pinapatamaan dito yung Spanish government, yung Spanish friars. Okay? And then, anong nangyari? Na curious ang Governor General. So, he asked for a copy. Binigyan naman siya ni Rizal ng kopya. Ang nakakatuwa dito kay Governor General, binigyan niya ng bodyguard si Rizal. Okay? It was Jose Taviel de Andrade. Ito yung kapatid nang naging lawyer ni Rizal nung siya ay nasa trial bago siya ipapatay, di ba? Si Jose Taviel de Andrade, ang kapatid ni Lieutenant Luis Andrade na naging lawyer ni Rizal. Okay, nabasa naman ni Governor General yung Noli Metangere and sabi niya, wala naman daw mali dun sa nilalaman ng Noli. Nonetheless, He had it banned when the reports were submitted to him by the Commission of Censorship. Kaya lang ipinagbawal ni Governor General na magkaroon ng kopya or magkaroon ng distribution ng Noli Metangere sa mga tao. Out of curiosity, mas naging interesado yung mga tao at mas naging popular yung Noli Metangere. Kasi nga, gusto nilang basahin. Okay? And according to historians, para hindi mahuli yung mga tao na gustong bumasa, Nung novel ni Rizal, binabasa nila ito kada gabi para walang makakita. And now we're moving on to the Noli Metangere cover. If you will look to the cover, it already tells us every bit of what's in the novel. So ito, sadya mismo ni Rizal na siya ang gumawa. Siya mismo ang nag-drawing. Siya mismo ang gumawa ng detalye. And bawat details, bawat uh, drawing dito ay may meaning. So let's try to see. Okay, as you can see, merong cross dito sa may cover. Anong sinisimbolize nung cross or nung crucifix? It symbolizes sufferings or paghihirap. And you will also see pomelo blossoms and laurel leaves. It symbolizes honor and fidelity. Okay? Karangalan at katapatan. Yung pomelo blossoms, yan ay ginagamit daw pampabango. Okay? To use as a scent, pagka sila ay nagkakaroon ng mga prayer, nagkakaroon ng ritual. And then yung laurel leaves naman, ito yung ginagamit na parang corona or crown during Greek Olympics. Okay, kung mapapansin natin yung mga Greek gods and goddesses, di ba meron silang dahon ng laurel na nakakabit sa ulo nila. And then meron dito ang silhouette of a Filipina. Sino yung babae dito? It's Maria Clara. And you will also notice na merong burning torch dito. It symbolizes rage and passion. Meaning to say, ito ay nagsisimbolismo ng galit at pagnanasa. And then you will also notice na merong sunflowers. It symbolizes enlightenment. Okay? It symbolizes a new beginning, parang may bagong pag-asa. And there is also bamboo stalks that were cut down but grew back. It symbolizes resilience or pagiging matatag. ba diba parang sa bamboo yan, na kapag may bagyo or kahit anong lakas ng hangin, magbabaw down lang yan, pero hindi sila yan mapuputol or matutumba. Okay? So, yun, it symbolizes resilience, pagiging matatag daw ng mga Pilipino. And then you will also see a man in a cassock with hairy feet. Ito naman, sinisimbolize niya yung mga pari. Okay? Mga pari na ginagamit ang religion in a dirty way. And then you will also see chains or um, mga kadena. It symbolizes slavery, pang-aalipin. And then you will also notice na may mga whips. Okay? Yung whips, mga latigo. It symbolizes cruelties ng mga Spaniards. And then last one, 
the helmet of the Guardia Civil. Okay, it symbolizes the arrogance of those in authority. Okay, mga kayabangan daw ng mga taong may posisyon sa gobyerno. O ba diba, napaka-metaphoric ng libro ni Rizal? Libro pa lang, hindi mo pa yun open na Makikita mo na na may mga simbolismo pala. Meron palang ibig sabihin yung bawat drawing sa cover ng Noli Metangere. Okay, now we're moving on to the characters in the Noli Metangere. Although the novel is a work of fiction, wala namang katotohanan, the novel can be considered a true story of the Philippines during the last decades of Spanish rule. The characters used by Rizal in the Noli were persons who actually existed during those times. Okay, uh, yung mga characters na ginamit ni Rizal, some of the characters talaga ay totoo, okay? Uh, naibase siya sa totoong buhay. For example, si Maria Clara, Si Maria Clara, siya si Leonor Rivera, the long-time sweetheart of Jose Rizal. And then si Tasho, or Pilosopo Tasho, siya yung kuya ni Rizal. It was Pasiano. And then si Padre Salvi daw, siya daw si Father Antonio Pierna Vieja of the Augustinian Order. And then si Kapitan Chago, siya daw si Captain Hilario Sonico of San Nicolas. Doña Victorina was Doña Agustina Medel. And then, yung magkapatid na si Basilio and si Crispin were the Crisostomo brothers of Hagonoy, Bulacan. And then si Padre Damaso, siya naman daw yung typical na abusadong pari, typical abusive friar during Rizal's time. Okay, so isa-isahin natin silang kilalanin. First, we have Crisostomo Ibarra, also known in his full name as Juan Crisostomo Ibarra y Magsalid. Siya yung Pilipino na nakapag-aral ng pitong taon sa Europe. Siya ang fiancé. Okay? Ni Maria Clara. And then siya ay anak ni Don Rafael Ibarra. Siya ang main character sa kwento. Siya rin ang most important character. Sino ang nire-represent ni Crisostomo Ibarra? Okay, Ibarra represented the affluent and liberal European educated Filipino, mga nakapag-aral sa Europa. Okay? Next, we have Elias. Sino naman si Elias? Elias is Ibarra's mysterious friend. A master boater and also a fugitive. When we say fugitive, siya ay nagtatago, siya ay wanted. Okay? So, he was referred to at one point as the pilot. Okay, sino siya? Siya ay yung tipo ng character na gusto niyang humingi ng revolution. Gusto niyang mag-conduct ng revolution. In the past, dito kasi sa story, yung lolo ni Ibarra at yung lolo ni Elias ay hindi okay. Okay? Hindi maganda yung kanilang relationship Kasi pinasunog ng lolo ni Ibarra Yung warehouse Nung grandfather or yung lolo ni Elias Kaya Ang nangyari kay Elias Nagtatago siya, tumatakas siya Pero in the story, never namang gumanti Si Elias kay Ibarra okay? Actually, dalawang beses niya pang tinulungan Si Ibarra dito sa kwento Sino ang nire-represent ni Elias Sa panahon natin ngayon? Okay, so si Elias, nire-represent niya yung mga Filipino masses, yung mga tao, yung mga typical na Pilipino. Okay, the common people who suffered from Spanish brutalities and abuse due to their powerlessness in the novel. Kasi si Elias, wala naman din siyang power dito. Wala siyang lakas, wala siyang kakayahan na labanan ang Spanish government. So nire-represent niya yung mga common people. Next character, we have Maria Clara. Maria Clara de los Santos, siya ang sweetheart, siya ang fiancé ni Juan Crisostomo Ibarra. She was the legitimate daughter of Father Damaso and Pia Alba. Take note, ang nagampon kay Maria Clara ay si Kapitan Chago, pero ang kanyang biological father ay si Father Damaso. Paano nangyari yun? Nirape ni Father Damaso si Pia Alba at ang naging bunga ay si Maria Clara. Okay, she symbolizes the Filipino womanhood in their fidelity or loyalty. And then, coyness or pagiging mahiyain, pagiging conservative and religiosity of the woman in real Filipino society. Okay, next we have Father Damaso. His full name is Damaso Verdolagas. Isa siyang pari. And na-mention ko kanina, siya ang biological father ni Maria Clara. Isa siyang antagonist. When we say antagonist, contra bida. Pag protagonist, bida. Okay? Siya ang antagonist sa novel. Sino ang nirepresent niya? Yung mga mapang-abusong pari nung panahon ni Rizal. Next, we have Sisa. For sure, kilalang kilala nyo si Sisa. The mother of Basilio and Crispin who became insane. Okay, siya ang nanay ni Basilio at ni Crispin. Si Basilio at Crispin, ito yung magkapatid na sakristan na nagsaserve sa church. 
and then nabaliw si Sisa nung nawala yung kanyang anak. Sinong nire-represent kayo ni Sisa? Okay, uh, she represented the unfortunate Filipino mothers losing her two sons. Um, nire-represent din ni Sisa yung mga typical characteristics ng mga Filipino mothers. Okay? Yung mga nanay natin na willing to defend their sons and daughters or willing to defend us from all forms of injustices or accusations. Ganun ang pagkakadescribe kay Sisa. Siya daw ay isang mapagmahal na ina. Next, we have Kapitan Chago. His full name is Don Santiago de los Santos. He is known as the illegitimate father and stepfather of Maria Clara. Nakatira siya sa Binondo. Siya ay isang illegal opium leader and at the same time isa rin siyang landlord. So he represented a businessman who used his money to work for him even in religious life and obligations. To the common people, Kapitan Chago was a symbol of the kasik mentality or yung mga bossy type na tao. Ang nakakatawa dito kay Kapitan Chago, he never prayed to God even in the face of difficulties. Diba tayo kasi, kapag nahihirapan tayo or feeling natin wala ng solusyon sa problema natin, we always pray to God asking for His guidance and then humihingi tayo ng tulong. Sa kanya, ang motto niya sa buhay, he let his money pray for him. Okay? According kay Rizal, si Kapitan Chago nire-represent niya yung mga Filipinos na walang ibang ginawa kundi protektahan yung kanilang sariling interest at yung kanilang business interest. Next character, we have Piloso Potasio, also known as Don Anastasio. He was portrayed in the novel as pessimistic. Ang pessimistic, ito yung mga tipo ng tao na laging napoforsi yung mga worst thing na pwedeng mangyari in the future. For example, sila yung mga parang negative thinker. So, sila yung mga tao na ganito mag-isip. Hala, feeling ko hindi ako nakapasa sa exam. Hala, feeling ko hindi ako pasok sa dance lister. Hala, feeling ko hindi ako nakapasa sa interview. Sila yung mga pessimistic. Okay? Ang lagi nilang naisip yung masamang mangyayari. Okay? Kapag optimistic, sila naman yung mga positive thinker. Ah, feeling ko pumasa naman ako. Feeling ko pasado ako sa interview. Feeling ko pasok ako sa dance lister. Okay? So, si Pilo sa Potasio daw ay pessimistic. Laging negative yung kanyang nakikita. Sino ang nire-represent ni Piloso Potasio? He represented Rizal's epitome of a philosopher. When you say philosopher, great thinker, mga mataong matatalino. Okay? Kaya lang minsan na may misunderstood kasi si Piloso Potasio sa kwento ng Noli. Okay? And akala pa nga nila lunatic siya. Akala nila siya ay baliw. Kasi madalas siyang nakikipag-argue. Okay? Lagi may argument kapag makakausap mo raw si Piloso Potasio dun sa kwento. Okay? And majority ng kanyang topic ay about Catholic Church and yung mga reforms sa government. Next, we have Doña Victorina. Her complete name is Victorina de los Reyes de Espadaña. Okay, etong babaeng ito ay feeling niya sa sarili niya isa siyang peninsulares. Okay, na-discuss natin to nung prelim. Okay, when we say peninsulares, sila yung mga taong ipinanganak sa Spain at tumira sa Pilipinas. But take note, si Doña Victorina isang purong Pilipina. Okay, feeling niya sa sarili niya isa siyang peninsulares, feeling niya isa siyang Espanyol. Okay, si Doña Victorina, alam ko makarelate kayo dito dahil nire-represent pa rin ni Doña Victorina ang karamihan sa mga Pilipino ngayon. Okay, yung pagiging social climber. ba? Diba? Pag sinabi kasi nating social climber, a person who is eager to gain a higher status in life. Next character, we have Pedro, ang mapangabusong asawa ni Sisa. Walang ibang ginawa si Pedro dun sa kwento ng Noli kundi uminom at Magsugal, okay? Sabong, cockfighting. Next, we have Don Rafael Ibarra. Si Don Rafael Ibarra ay isang concerned citizen, napaka mabuting tao. Okay? Isa rin siyang uh, property owner dun sa bayan ng San Diego at siya ang father or ama ni Crisostomo Ibarra. And then, binansagan siyang heretic at filibustero ni Father Dama. So, when we say heretic, sila yung mga taong uh, against at hindi sumusunod sa utos ng simbahan, okay, heretic. Pag filibustero, pag sinabihan kang filibustero, ito yung mga tao na hindi sumusunod sa gusto ng government. Okay, so yun yung ipinatong kay Don Rafael Ibarra. Isa raw siyang heretic at the same time, isa raw siyang filibustero. Kaya galit sa kanya si Father Damaso. Okay, sa kwento ng Noli, si Don Rafael Ibarra ay nakulong dahil sa kanyang pagiging mabuting tao at may malasakit sa kapwa. Okay, dun sa isang scene kasi, Merong isang bata na binubuli ng isang Spanish tax collector. Okay, e ngayon ang ginawa ni Don Rafael Ibarra, pinagtanggol niya yung bata. 
and hindi naman inaasahan na mababagok pala yung ulo ng Spanish tax collector and then of course dumugo and then namatay siya. Okay, so napagbintangan siya na siya daw yung pumatay dun sa Spanish tax collector and then nakulong siya and then nung kinulong na siya nagsilabasan lahat ng mga taong may galit kay Don Rafael Ibarra. Okay, sino ang sinisimbolize ni Don Rafael Ibarra? Uh, he symbolizes an affluent landlord with a social conscience. Okay, siya yung tipo ng tao na may concern sa problema at injustices ng isang lugar or isang society. Okay, makikita natin siya dun sa mga Pilipino ngayon na merong malasakit sa mga tao at the same time may pakialam sa nangyayari sa society. Okay, next character, we have the schoolmaster. Hindi naman siya na pangalanan, a teacher at San Diego whose view in the novel represented the weak and useless education in the Philippines. He attributes the problem from facilities and methods of learning that the friars implemented in the country. Okay, pangarap niya na baguhin yung method of teaching sa bayan ng San Diego. Okay, hindi siya satisfied sa way of education, the system of education ng mga friars sa bayan ng San Diego. Okay, next we have the supporting characters na wala naman na masyadong naiambag sa kwento pero importante pa rin yung kanilang role. We have Tandang Pablo, the leader of the rebels kasi dun sa story nagkaroon ng isang rebellion at yung pamilya niya ay nasira at nadamay din kaya sa sumali sa revolution. Next we have Basilio, siya yung panganay na anak ni Sisa and then yung bunso naman si Crispin. Si Crispin ang bunsong anak ni Sisa, siya ay napagbintangan na nagnakaw daw sa simbahan. Okay, and then, nung time na pinaparusahan siya, hanggang sa gusto siyang paaminin, siya rin ay namatay. Okay, hindi niya rin kinaya yung pagmamalupit ng mga sakristan, ng mga kapwa niya sakristan sa simbahan. And then next, we have Padre Sibayla, isa siyang Pilipinong pari. And then next, we also have Padre Salvi. Okay, siya ay isang secret admirer ni Maria Clara. Meron siyang gusto, meron siyang pagnanasa kay Maria Clara. And then the Alferez, siya yung pinakamataas na pinuno ng Guardia Civil at mortal na kalaban ng mga pari sa bayan ng San Diego. Next, we have Don Tiburcio, ang asawa ni Doña Victorina. Isa siyang lumpo at masasabi natin na siya ay isang under desire. Okay? He also pretended to be a doctor. Next character, we have Doña Consolacion, the wife of the Alferez. And then another woman who passed herself as a peninsular. Feeling niya siya ay Espanyol din. Parang Doña Victorina ang dating netong Doña Consolacion. And then, uh, kilalang kilala siya dahil sa kanyang pangaabuso kay Sisa. And we can also say na si Doña Consolacion ang competitor ni Kapitan Chago in Godliness. Kasi ito namang si Doña Consolacion, nagpipretend siya na siya raw ay religyoso by showing off to the public what she could contribute to the church. Yung ganitong uh, personality ay still existing sa panahon natin ngayon. Hindi naman lahat na nagsisimba ay religyoso, hindi naman lahat na nagsisimba at pumupunta sa simbahan ay talagang pumunta ron para magdasal at magpasalamat sa Panginoon, di ba? So, ganun ang katangian ni Doña Consolacion. The last character, we have Captain General, walang specific name, the most powerful official in the Philippines. Okay, so kung mapapansin natin dito sa story, kakampi ni Ibarra ang government, the Captain General, and then yung Alferez kanina. Ang kalaban nila dito ay yung mga secular press, yung mga corrupt officials. So, ayan yung mga characters sa Noli. Actually, hindi naman lahat na bangkit, pero sila yung mga important characters na talagang nabigyan ng emphasis yung kanilang role sa kwento. Okay, we're now moving on to the most awaited part of this discussion. Ano nga ba ang kwento ng Noli? I know you are all familiar with this story kasi na-discuss nyo na to during your high school years, tama? So, I'm giving you the summary of this novel. Okay, so let me read the story, the summary of this novel. Having completed his studies in Europe, Juan Crisostomo Ibarra came back to the Philippines after a seven-year absence. In his honor, Captain Chago threw a get-together party which was attended by friars and other prominent figures. In an unfortunate incident, former curate Father Damaso belittled and slandered Ibarra. But Ibarra brushed off the insult and took no offense. So, nag-start pala yung kwento ng Noli nung umuwi na ng Philippines si Juan Crisostomo Ibarra, yung main character ng novel. Okay, nag-stay siya sa Europe for 7 years para mag-aral. And then, nagkaroon ng isang welcome party sa kanya 
na pinangunahan ni Captain Chago sa bahay ni Captain Chago and then marami daw dumalo dun sa welcome party na yun and then majority daw ng mga tao ay pinapraise si Juan Crisostomo Ibarra dahil sa kanyang mga achievements unfortunately may isang tao na instead na i-congratulate siya at i-praise siya ay kabaliktaran yung ginawa it was Father Damaso Okay? And isa sa mga notable lines ni Father Damaso nung event na ay sabi niya kay Juan Crisosto Maybara, ba't ka pa mag-aaksaya ng oras at pagod na mag-aral sa ibang bansa kung pwede mo namang gawin dito sa Philippines? Yun ang sinabi ni Father Damaso sa kanya. Pero itong si Juan Crisosto Maybara, dead ma lang. Okay? Hindi niya pinatulan yung sinabi ni Father Damaso. Nag-smile lang siya and then parang walang nangyari. Okay? Let's see what's gonna happen next. Ibarra went to see Maria Clara, his love interest, a beautiful daughter of Captain Chago. Their long-standing love was clearly manifested in this meeting and Maria Clara cannot help but to reread the letters her sweetheart had written to her before he went to Europe. Before Ibarra left for San Diego, Lieutenant Guevara Aguardo Civil revealed to him the incidents preceding the death of his father, Don Rafael Ibarra, a rich hacendero of the town. After ng kainan, pumunta si Ibarra kay Maria Clara para magkausap sila at magkamustahan and then wala daw ibang magawa si Maria Clara kundi basahin ulit yung mga letters na pinadala sa kanya ni Ibarra. And then, nung paalis na daw ng bahay si Juan Crisostom o Ibarra, nakasalubong niya itong Lieutenant Guevara. And then, si Lieutenant Guevara, habang naglalakad sila, naikwento niya yung mga nangyari din sa kanyang father or yung sa nangyari sa father ni Juan Crisostom o Ibarra. So, let's see kung ano yung mga sinabi ni Lieutenant. According to the Lieutenant, Don Rafael was unjustly accused of being a heretic and filibuster. Father Damaso's animosity against Ibarra's father was aggravated by another incident when Don Rafael helped out on a fight between a tax collector and a student fighting and the former's death was blamed on him, although it was not deliberate. Suddenly, all of those who thought ill of him surfaced with additional complaints. Okay, according sa pagkakadescribe ni Lieutenant, um, naakusahan daw ni Father Damaso itong father ni Juan Crisostomo Ibarra na si Don Rafael bilang heretic and filibuster. And then, umiting pa yung galit kasi one time, pinigilan ni Don Rafael Ibarra yung nag-aaway na Spanish tax collector and a student. Kasi itong Spanish tax collector, binubuli niya daw yung student. E ngayon, ang purpose ni Don Rafael Ibarra ay pigilan yung dalawa or awatin. And napalaban siya ngayon dun sa Spanish tax collector. Sa hindi inaasang pagkakataon, nabagok yung ulo ng Spanish tax collector. So, namatay siya. Okay? And then, nakulong daw si Don Rafael Ibarra na pagbintangan siya. And then, nagulat na lang sila nung nasa kulungan siya, bakit nagsisilabasan lahat ng mga tao may galit sa kanya. Okay, so marami pala ang may galit kay Don Rafael Ibarra. Let me read the next line. He was in prison and just when the matter was almost settled, he got sick and died in jail. Still not content with what he had done, Father Damaso arranged for Don Rafael's corpse to be dug up and transferred from the Catholic cemetery to the Chinese cemetery because he thought it is inappropriate to allow a heretic such as Don Rafael to have a Catholic burial ground. Unfortunately, it was raining and because of the bothersome weight of the cadaver, the man in charge of the burial decided to throw the corpse into lake. So, sa pangyayari na to, malapit na sanang lumaya si Don Rafael Ibarra. Kaya lang, may sakit na kasi siya nung time na to at hindi niya nakinaya kasi nagkasakit siya. So, namatay din siya. Hindi na rin siya nakalabas ng kulungan. And then, hindi pa nakontento si Father Damaso. Nung namatay na si Don Rafael Ibarra at nilibing na sa Catholic Cemetery, bigla niyang pinahukay. Okay? So, nilipat siya from Catholic Cemetery, ililipat yung labi ni Don Rafael Ibarra sa Chinese Cemetery. Kaya lang, nung time na to, biglang umulan. Okay, malakas yung ulan. And then yung mga in charge na maglipat nung labi ni Don Rafael Ibarra sa Chinese Cemetery, hindi na nila na ituloy. Okay, yung ginawa nila, tinapon na lang nila yung katawan ni Don Rafael Ibarra sa lake or sa lawa. Hindi rin nabigyan ng maayos na himlay si Don Rafael Ibarra. Okay, so let's see kung anong gagawin ni Ibarra. Revenge was not in Ibarra's plans. Instead, he carried thought his father's plan of putting up a school since he believed that education would pave the way to his country's progress. During the inauguration of the school, Ibarra would have been killed in a sabotage head alias, a mysterious man who had warned Ibarra earlier of a plot to assassinate him. Instead, the hard killer met an unfortunate incident and died. The sequence of events proved to be traumatic for Maria Clara who got seriously ill 
but was luckily cured by the medicine Ibarra sent to her. Okay, so wala palang plano na maghiganti si Ibarra dun sa ginawa ni Father Damaso dun sa kanyang ama. Okay, instead, ang ginawa niya na lang at pinagtuunan niya ng pansin yung nasimulan ng kanyang father na magtayo ng school sa bayan ng San Diego. And then, during the inauguration of the school, muntik na daw mapatay si Ibarra. Okay, kasi nag-hired itong si Father Damaso ng isang killer na papatay kay Ibarra. Buti na lang at nalaman agad ni Elias. Okay, itong si Elias, isa siyang mysterious man na tutulong kay Ibarra ng ilang beses. Okay, so nakaligtas si Ibarra at ang napatay ay yung killer mismo. Na trauma daw si Maria Clara nung nalaman niya to, kaya nagkasakit daw siya. Pero agad naman daw siyang gumaling dahil pinadalan siya ng gamot ni Ibarra. So what will happen next? After the inauguration, Ibarra hosted a luncheon during which Father Damaso uninvited and gate-crushing the luncheon insulted him. Ibarra ignored the priest's insolence but when the latter slandered the memory of his dead father, he was no longer able to restrain himself at Father Damaso prepared to stop the latter for his imprudence. As a consequence, Father Damaso excommunicated Ibarra. Father Damaso took this opportunity to persuade the already hesitant father of Maria Clara to forbid his daughter from marrying Ibarra. The friar wished to marry a peninsular named Linares who has arrived from Spain. After nung inauguration ng school na ipinatayo ni Ibarra, nagkaroon daw ng isang salo-salo, tanghalian, okay, dun sa kanilang lugar. And then, hindi invited si Father Damas. So, kaya lang, nakapunta pa rin siya. O, diba? Ang kapal na mukha ni Father Damas so rito. Uninvited siya, pero nakapunta siya. Okay? Pero then, maparin si Rizal sa mga sinasabi ni Father Damas. So, kaya lang, nung inaatake na ni Father Damas, so, si Don Rafael Ibarra, hindi na nakayanan or hindi na nakapagtimpi si Juan Crisostomo Ibarra. Okay? So, muntik niya daw mapatay si Father Damas. So, muntik niyang saksakin. Kaya lang, na pigilan siya at naawat agad siya ni Maria Clara. And then, hindi agad nag-atubili itong si Father Damas. So, pinarusahan agad si Ibarra. Nawa siyang excommunicated, excommunicado, meaning to say, uh, wala kang karapatan na mag-join or mag-participate sa mga services at sa mga events sa church. Hindi ka pwedeng pumasok sa simbahan, hindi ka pwedeng mag-participate kung ano man ang event sa simbahan. And then, dahil naparusahan na si Ibarra, yung opportunity na to ay kinuha na rin ni Father Damaso para pagsabihan si Kapitan Chago na wag ipakasal si Maria Clara kay Ibarra. Okay? Ang gusto nang mangyari ng friar, ang gusto nang mangyari ni Father Damaso, ikasal siya dun sa isang uh, Espanyol na si Linares. So let's see what's gonna happen next. With the help of Captain General, Ibarra's excommunication was nullified and the Archbishop decided to accept him as a member of the Church once again. But as fate would have it, Some incident of which Ibarra had known nothing was blamed on him and he was wrongly arrested and imprisoned. But the accusation against him was overruled because during the litigation that followed, nobody could testify that he was indeed involved. Unfortunately, his letter to Maria Clara somehow got into the hands of the jury and was manipulated such that it then became evidence against him. Okay, yung parusa kay Rizal na pagiging excommunicado ay hindi rin nagtagal kasi natulungan siya nung Captain General. As I mentioned to you earlier, kakampi ni Rizal dito sa story yung Captain General, pati yung Alferez. Okay, kaya napawalang bisa rin yung pagiging excommunicado ni Ibarra at natanggap din siya agad sa Catholic Church. Kaya lang, hindi tumigil si Father Damaso. Okay, ngayon si Father Damaso, pati si Father Salvi, nag-organize sila ng isang rebellion among the poor. Ito mga tao na na-involved dito sa rebellion, yung mga taong nakaranas din ng injustices sa kamay ng mga Spaniards. So nag-organize yung dalawang pari ng rebellion and then napasok si Ibarra dito sa issue ng rebellion kasi napagbintangan siya na siya daw yung leader ng rebellion na nangyari. Noong una, wala namang ebidensya na nagamit kay Ibarra. Okay? Kaya lang, uh, yung letter na pinadala niya pala kay Maria Clara ay nagamit. Okay, na manipulate siya, dinaya para gamitin na ebidensya sa kanya. Kaya siya ay nakulong. So anong susunod na mangyayari? So let me continue my reading. Meanwhile, in Captain Chago's residence, a party was being held to announce the upcoming wedding of Maria Clara and Linares. Ibarra, with the help of Elias, took this opportunity and escaped from prison. But before leaving, Ibarra talked to Maria Clara and accused her for betraying him thinking that she gave the letter to wrote her to the jury. 
Maria Clara explained to Ibarra that she will never conspire against him but that she was forced to surrender Ibarra's letter to her in exchange for the letters written by her mother even before she was born. Maria Clara was therefore not the daughter of Captain Chago but of Father Damaso. So ang nangyari pala dito, nakatakas si Juan Crisostomo Ibarra sa kulungan. Sa tulong ulit ni Elias. Okay? And then, nagkaroon ng party dun sa bahay ni Kapitan Chago para dun sa mangyayaring kasal ni Maria Clara at ni Linares. And then, pumunta ngayon si Ibarra at si Elias dun sa bahay ni Kapitan Chago para kausapin ni Ibarra si Maria Clara. And then, inakusan niya si Maria Clara na tinrider niya daw si Ibarra dahil binigay niya daw yung mga letter dun sa jury para gamitin ebidensya sa kanya. And then, inexplain naman ni Maria Clara yung kanyang part. Sabi niya, binigay niya lang daw yung letter kasi ang kapalit daw nun ay yung letter na naisulat sa kanya ng kanyang mother bago mamatay yung kanyang ina. Okay? And then, sa letter na yun, nalaman ni Maria Clara na ang totoo niya palang father ay si Father Damaso at hindi si Kapitan Chago. Kasi na-mention ko kanina na ni Rape ni Father Damaso, si Pia Alba, Doña Pia Alba, at ang naging bunga ay si Maria Clara. Okay, and then, anong sumunod na nangyari after that? Afterwards, Ibarra and Elias bounded a boat and left the palace. Elias instructed Ibarra to lie down and the former covered the latter with grass to conceal the latter's presence. As luck would have it, they were spotted by their enemies. Elias thought he could outsmart them and jump into the water. The guards rained shots on the person in the water, all the while not knowing that they were aiming at the wrong man. Okay, after mag-usap ni Ibarra at ni Maria Clara, tumakas na si Elias at si Ibarra. Sumakay sila sa isang bangka. Okay, so ang way nila doon ay nasa Pasig River sila. Papunta na sila ng Laguna Bay. And then hinahabol daw sila ng kanilang mga kalaban ng mga Guardia Civil. Ang hindi alam ng mga Guardia Civil, yung tumalon dun sa tubig ay si Elias. Ang akala kasi nila, si Ibarra yun. So, uh, nag-conclude ngayon yung mga Guardia Civil na napatay na nila si Ibarra. Okay? Pero nakaligtas si Ibarra. At ang natamaan ay si Elias. So, let's see the last part. Maria Clara, thinking that Ibarra has been killed in the shooting incident, was greatly overcome with grief. Rob of hope and severe disillusion, she asked Father Damaso to confine her into a nunnery. Father Damaso reluctantly agreed when Maria Clara threatened to take her own life and be known to her, Ibarra is still alive and able to escape. It was Elias who had taken the shots. It was Christmas Eve when Elias woke up in the forest gravely wounded and barely alive. It was in the forest that Elias found Basilio and his lifeless mother, Sisa. So nakarating yung balita kay Maria Clara. Akala niya napatay na si Ibarra. Okay? So naglulok sa si Maria Clara nung time na to and then nakiusap siya dun sa kanyang totoong ama kay Father Dama. So na dali na lang siya sa kumbento at maging isang madre. Tinako niya si Father Dama so na papatayin niya yung sarili niya or magsuicide siya kung hindi siya papayagang maging isang madre. Ay, hindi niya alam na si Ibarra ay buhay pa at ang sugatan at ang may tama ay si Elias. It was Christmas Eve, okay, Pasko, nung nagising si Elias dun sa may kagubatan. And then nakita niya na nandun si Basilio at saka si Sisa. Okay, anong ginagawa ni Basilio nung time na to? Uh, ililibing niya na rin yung kanyang nanay na si Sisa kasi patay na rin si Sisa na to. Ang pakiusap sa kanya ni Elias ay sunugin yung kanilang katawan. Okay, so sinunod naman ni Basilio yung utos ni Elias. And then, ang magiging season 2 or part 2 ng Noli ay yung El Filibusterismo. Okay? The sequel of Noli is the El Filibusterismo. Kaya lang, dito sa part na to ng El Fili, magbabalik na si Ibarra, pero sa ibang katauhan na. Hindi na siya Juan Crisostomo Ibarra, siya na ay si Simon. Okay? At yan yung dapat yung abangan sa next chapter ng ating lesson. Okay, so that ends our lecture for chapter 6, the Noli Metangere. I hope you have learned something. Thank you so much for listening, my dear students. Have a great day ahead.